somebody described it once. I think they said something along the lines of if the the figurehead of your religion is still alive, then it's a cult. If the figurehead of your cult's dead, it's a religion. I think that's that tends to work as a rule of thumb. So this podcast is more of a, a cult than a religion? At the moment, unless uh, unless you snuff it in the evening. <laughs> Right, Christmas is done. It's over. It was the worst Christmas ever, but at least we had Christmas to look forward to. Now, we've got absolutely nothing other than dredge and misery in a winter replete with death, gloom, and the coronavirus. But we do have one thing, which is this podcast episode with the brilliant Stephen Knight. Stephen is an atheist who has made a name for himself online and in the media as both an outspoken critic of woke culture and critical race theory, and also as a mate of comedian Ricky Gervais. He is the host of the Godless Spellchecker podcast, which goes by The Night Tube on YouTube. Do check out the podcast. He's had some really big names on it, from Douglas Murray and Sam Harris to Ricky Gervais and me, the lucky so-and-so. I was on his podcast just a couple weeks ago, so do check that out. We do talk about how Ricky Gervais, who is a hero of mine, first approached Stephen to come on his podcasts, which makes for a really great story. We also go into the problems with religion, and we talk a lot about class, which is particularly funny and strange in the UK, although it exists everywhere, of course. Um, Stephen is from a working class background in Manchester and believes that if anything does make us unequal, it is class rather than race or gender. But even so, he wouldn't want to play that card as he prefers to judge people as individuals. I think I've got that summary about right, but do listen on because it's far more nuanced than that. I have to respect that my listeners come from a range of backgrounds and viewpoints. This discussion might put some of you off at first, but do stick with it. I don't think we are that disrespectful to woke culture or religions, and maybe we'll find some common ground. This episode came at the opportune moment. Just this week, prominent writer Julie Birchall had her book about the problems with woke cancel culture cancelled after she joked about Islam online. And a school in the US is being sued after trying to force white students to publicly recognize their innate racism and privilege, threatening them with failing grades if they refused to comply. Where does this end, according to Stephen? Well, some pretty dark places. I'll be back at the end to give out a bit of a New Year's honours list for those of you who have written in, reviewed the podcast on Apple and contributed to my Patreon membership, which keeps the podcast going. If you haven't done any of those things above, please do. Remember, I'm on patreon.com slash andrewgold. It's Christmas after all. The time when nobody has any money to spare on these kinds of things, admittedly. But anyway, I love that you keep listening and I'll see you at the end. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think we're good. That is fine. I, you know, I once had a thing like that where I didn't, I hadn't got it plugged in. It was one of my first uh, interviews. And do you know, do you know who Lord Daniel Finkelstein is? Yes, yes. So it was like a big, he's probably the scariest person I interviewed in terms of just like, he's a proper person, you know? Yeah. We're all sitting here at home in our pajamas and he's a real guy. <laughs> he's a real person, yeah. <laughs> and um, I realized, because I, I live in Berlin and I was back in London for that for a few days at my mum's house. And I realized I was running out of battery and I couldn't plug it into the wall uh, because it was a German plug and just the oh. panic. And I basically like sent my mum on like a, a scavenger mission for a plug while I talked to him and it got down to like 3%. And she, she'd she like gone round the shops and she'd asked a, a chemist if he just had to happen to have a charger in his and he should bring it back later. And she she came home and gave it to me. Wow. I mean, this is worthy of an HBO, HBO adaptation. <laughs> ticking, yeah. ticking time bomb scenario. Yeah, I, I lost a rec- I've lost one recording since doing this and it was, um, it was this Zoom recorder I've got and it didn't have any batteries in it, but it was plugged into the mains and I accidentally oh knocked, caught the mains wire. And it came out and it just wiped the, the recording. Oh, like, who was that? I wasn't. It was my, my co-host recording our basic talk bullshit for an hour. Luckily, okay. but you know it could have been a lot worse. So I, I, I record in several ways now, just so I've got a backup. Just to, oh, man. Just to be sure. Bloody hell! Where are you now? Uh, where do you? Whereabouts do you live? And what tier are you in? That's the question everyone wants to know. <laughs> the answer. Manchester to. and tier three. What does that mean? What's the? What does tier three mean? 
It means we're not quite as fucked as the South, but not far off. We're, we're one bad day away from having Christmas cancelled. So oh, yeah, yeah, we can... Um, have we started, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> this is it. This is yeah. it. It's a great start. This is golden. This is this is gold. <laughs> yeah. Where do you stand on the whole lockdown thing? What Are we overreacting or under? You know, this is a really tricky one for me because I like to be opinionated and I like to delve into difficult issues and try and figure out what's the correct way of going about it, what isn't. And I'm just so clueless on, on this topic in general. And I, given the health implications of it and everything else, I just don't feel comfortable strongly opining on it uh, in terms of what's right or what's wrong. I, I mean, I've discussed it in a very general sense and I've had people on my show to talk about it. Like, for instance, I've had Toby Young on my show and he's very anti-lockdown. You know, he's, mm. he's uh, he created the Lockdown Skeptics platform and he said some things on my show which I, I i just don't have the knowledge or the expertise to either confirm or debunk so I, i've tended to stray away from it and personally I've, I've been following the rules uh pretty much the letter where i can um so that's where we are i tend to think that the people in charge probably know more than me now that might be a huge mistake on my part uh but when it, when they've got the backing of scientific advisors i tend to think they're probably doing what they think is right for the right reasons because i can't imagine them doing the things they do without good reasons in the sense that it could cost them the next election um yeah. public opinions through the floor uh regarding this as it is it's difficult no matter which way you go about it. So I, I can't think how they benefit from doing this from any other perspective other than they think it's what will save the most lives in the long run. But I think we'll we'll just have to wait and see when the dust settles and do the yeah. do the proper accounting then. I don't know. That was a very long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> do you think well I, I think I don't know either. And I think it's a it's a sort of a breath of fresh air to hear people say I don't know because everybody it seems like everybody, but it's obviously not everybody, but everybody on Twitter has such a strong opinion. Do you think it's a good indicator of maybe where somebody sits politically? Because it does seem to me that, uh, so Toby Young's obviously quite a right-wing political commentator um, mm. and he wants his freedom at all costs. It's individual freedom and liberty and I want to be able to go out and do what I want. A lot of left-wing people are complete opposite. I've got friends who are like, I will not go to that street down the road uh, because we're in that tier and I'm being very careful, even if it means leaving my grandma on her own for three weeks and never seeing her, you know. <laughs> so is, is, is it maybe quite a centrist position to be like, you know what, we don't know enough? Yeah, possibly. And it, it's very interesting, the, the dichotomy here, because we have, I mean, I think you're, I think you're spot on there. I think the most sceptical people are certainly the most vocally sceptical um, people on the lockdown are right-leaning conservatives. Uh, obviously, the, I think I tend to see from the left, the idea is that they're not, we're not doing enough or we're certainly not doing it fast enough. And I think you can, you can pretty much swap that in and out for the topic of climate change uh, as well. Um, but it, at the end of the day, it is a conservative government that are implementing these lockdown policies. So that's a very strange situation to be in when they're implementing the most draconian measures we've seen since the war. Yeah. And it's their own base that are very dissatisfied with the whole thing. So, yeah, I think it, I think it is a partisan issue, which is a shame, really. You think we could come together on an issue that affects everyone in such a, a big way, but no, politics it infects and, it, and infests everything eventually. Yeah, I wonder. I, I, is everything now political? Do you think every, every single thing is political now? I think social media is always all mental uh, and not in a good way. I, th I think. I mean, it was generally thought of as a positive thing to engage people in politics, especially at a younger age, because we, we all know how difficult it is to get the younger generation to vote. And um, I think we got that wish. I think everybody has a political opinion now. You cannot, it's impossible to scroll a social media feed, even a personal one now, without seeing someone's political hot take. And it's always done in a manner or with an approach that wouldn't be um, implemented in face-to-face -face situations down the pub. The, the way people engage with it feels very tribal when you throw social media into the mix. And social media for the, a large amount of people has come to be the conversation. That is where the argument is. It is where opinions exist. You are a nobody if you, especially certainly as a public figure, uh, unless you have a social media presence and you are opining on current issues day in day out so i think i think having this total and complete saturation of our everyday lives with political opinion is not a good thing i mean it, it can be an indicator of two things either we've lost our head in terms of our engagement with politics or the, pol the political situation is so bad at the moment that everybody has to have an opinion on it and i think it's probably a lot more of the former than the latter to be honest i do tend to think you know global pandemic aside and um 
the rise of Trump, I do think we are living in fairly calm waters in terms of politics. I think I think it's almost a luxury to go to war on the topics that people are going to war on politically. Mm. Uh, and that's not to downplay serious issues, but I do think social media and 24 hour news cycles and constantly seeing your crazy uncle post things just, just really exacerbates any situation. I wonder if it's like, it's so hard to know because I agree with, I, I find myself agreeing with you. It's why I wanted to have you on as well. I mean, that's one of the things you, I think you, you might agree with. It's very difficult to have people on your podcast. You have your own one, of course. Um, they got Godless Spellchecker, which which goes by Nighttube. Is that right? On YouTube and it's Godless Spellchecker. Is that right? Yeah, so I, I mean, the audio format when it first started went by the you know the Godless Spellchecker show, and I only ever planned on doing seven episodes. If I knew that I'd go into the hundreds, I probably would not have called it the Godless Spellchecker podcast. Right. So okay. I, I might have to I might have to think about rebranding. But uh, yeah, my video content goes under the banner of the Nighttube on YouTube with a K. And yeah, when you have, it's very different to sort of making a documentary, you know, if you think about the old Louis Theroux documentaries, he'd go and interview people with completely different views to his own. Whereas a podcast, mm. it's quite a strange thing to have somebody on who maybe you don't agree with. And then you're sort of platforming their views. And as you were saying about Toby Young, it's like, you don't know, you don't know enough perhaps to be able to say whether he's right or mm. wrong. And then he could be saying something quite dangerous. Yeah. It's interesting because when I started my, I mean, I look, I love a good Barney. I, I like a good argument. Uh, I'm happy to have them. And I'm somebody who's consumed a lot of debates. Mm. Uh, you know, it's something I enjoy. But when I started recording the podcast, I, I made a conscious decision not to host debates. I didn't want a weekly shouting fest. I wanted to host people who I thought was interesting, doing important work or had something important to say. Uh, and kind of platform them or, or learn from them. I, I used a lot of them in, a, in in the sense of a free lecture. I could get somebody on to educate me on a topic. And I, I sort of try and treat my audience with the, the level of respect to know that they're intelligent enough to make up their own minds. I always say that. I say, if you hear something, don't mm. take my word from it. Don't take my guest's word for it. Look, look into it. See if, they're, see if they're making a convincing argument. And if they're not, you can you can engage with them. You can engage with the, the piece of content I've just released. And um, I, I've always... I've always preferred the interview format because I'm not somebody, I know I'm, I'm rambling now, but I'm not somebody who enjoys to monologue or or to be a, a sort of preacher figure or to say to people, look, this is how it is and I'm going to tell you what's right and what's wrong and put the world to rights. I, I like to ask questions. I like to hear other people talk and I, and I try and, if I can, touch on issues that are not getting the spotlight shone on them on our normal mainstream news media. I mean, you, you yourself with the kind of topics you uh, have been poking at and, and uh, interviewing people that will know all about, uh, there are there are many things out there that would, would benefit from a good long form open converse, conversation, which just in terms of the climate or the, the format of mainstream media, we, we just don't appear to be getting. You know, what's tough though is, is I think, and you must find this as well is you sometimes start to sound when you're maybe arguing with somebody who's quite progressive or left-wing and like like how maybe the generation before us sounded when you might have said oh gay rights are a good idea and they were like oh it's gone too far now hmm. and now 20 years later or 30 years later there's another issue which is which might be trans or it might be the whole woke blm thing and we're the ones now in the middle going yeah oh, you know do, do, does that worry you yeah i think i think about this a lot because i am fully aware that being gay, for instance, I mean, trans rights and, and gay rights seem to be thrown in the same bracket. And I think that's possibly a category error. I suppose that's a whole different debate, but I, I'm very aware that in, in living history, being gay was pathologized. You had the the generation of people who were just fearful of something they didn't understand. They, you, you, you had the, you know, you throw religious conservatism in the mix. There was, I think in, in living memory that you could get treated for homosexuality on the National Health Service in, in the UK, which is just, it's insane to me to think about. So I'm constantly trying to check my biases. I'm, I, you know, am I just becoming an old man uh, howling at the new thing, the new the thing, oh, it's just a trend, you know, keep, away, keep them away from my kids yeah. type of attitude that we're so familiar with from older generations. And so that's why what I try and do is I try and lean on the science. I, I think one of the best things anyone can do at the earliest possible chance is just to acquaint yourself with the, the, the standard logical fallacies or how scientific inquiry works. And that isn't to say you'll never make mistakes or you'll never be misled or you'll never get things wrong. You absolutely will. But if you keep those things at the forefront of your investigations, you've got a higher chance of getting closer to whatever is true. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to do because you know how easy you can make life for yourself if you just swallowed 
out everything the progressives put out there, how how socially acceptable that is, how yeah. how you won't have to face that very uncomfortable moment in a in a group of friends where you put your hand up and say, actually, I'm not sure there are an unlimited amount of genders. Uh, mm. uh, you know, you that you suddenly smeared with a label. So, you know, if you just wanted a comfortable, easy life, I'd, you could just nod along to all these things. But again, I'm interested in what's true, and I'm certainly interested in what's true when it's deemed socially unacceptable to raise it or can lead to, you know, quote unquote, cancellation, uh, loss of platform, livelihood, things like that. So I, I always try and check my biases. And the, obviously the best way you can do that is by, you know, basic logic, first principles, uh, making sure that what you are opining is backed up by credible data or, and or science. But what's difficult about that, I suppose, and I, I find myself trying to trying to work this one out, is that you know you get someone very, very left and progressive who would agree that there are a billion whatever there might be, um, a Judith Butler and a Noam Chomsky. You know, these are smart, very well read yeah. people. And then on the right, you've got your—he's not even right wing to be honest—but you've got your Jordan Petersons and people like that. These are all very smart, well-researched people with totally differing opinions about about what's right. So maybe there is, is there just no truth? I think there is something to be considered objective reality and objective truth, d despite what Jordan Peterson might have. I mean, I find Jordan, I mean, this is a great point and something that I had to sh shake out of my head early on when engaging people with religion, because it's very easy just to assume people aren't very smart if they're having, you know, if they have opinions that aren't particularly logical or correct. And like you say, Jordan Peterson is an incredibly intelligent man. He, he has a lot of good things to say. He speaks a lot of truth. He's, um, his output on the idea of um, freedom of expression and, you know, the, the, the reasonable limits of that and forced speech and, you know, the work he's done talking about communism and things. I think that's all stellar and great. However, once you try and pin him down on the topic of a uh, creator, he, he starts speaking like a postmodernist, which is something that he himself has been very critical of. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the f best things you can do is just disabuse yourself of this idea that the religious people are, are just idiots, because that you know, or there's someone who's got a different mm. political opinion is not very smart. I think that's that's making the conversation very easy on yourself. I think it's it's all about not necessarily what you think, but how you think, and you can sort of see where Jordan Peterson is failing to think. I would say I was logically on that issue, but consistently, if you contrast it with his other work, work. so we've all got our little biases mm -hmm. and sacred cows and blind spots. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very easy to check those with other people rather than yourself, I think. Ian Hislop's religious as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's... See, I, I find <laughs> it very, very strange how... I mean, I, I find it very strange to, that Peter Hitchens is very religious yeah. as well yeah and because yeah. he seems to be someone who is very anti-bullshit for want of a better phrase and yeah. you know to to just swallow the gospel a whole and not question that and then be very um assertive and, and lucid on other topics i don't understand i mean it's, it's that cognitive dissonance isn't it, it can it has a lot to answer for it makes me start to think that a lot of the stuff that i might agree with that jordan peterson or peter hitchens say uh might be might be wrong because there's i feel like this if, if i had to i don't know if i had to i'm going to ask you in a minute actually actually i'll ask you now i mean one of the many things that got you into the public spotlight was how you would correct people's spelling of atheists because it is quite a hard yeah. word to spell but mm. now i think you probably tweet more about anti-woke stuff so i'd be interested to know if you see yourself as both or one more than the other and also because one thing i've underestimated doing this podcast because it, it does have all different sorts of people and there have been a few anti-woke people but every time people message me going what does woke mean so i'd love your interpretation of what woke is as well as mm. knowing you know are you an anti-woke person is that what you are yeah so i mean the atheist thing for me yeah, that was all that was it was almost like a gimmick uh, as a hook into a conversation so what i'd find is some of the most anti-atheist vitriol you could possibly think of would always correlate with the misspelling of the word atheist on twitter and it would just be great fun <laughs> to pick this up come up with some pithy response and and put the hashtag with the correct spelling you know um i, I before we accept where there's no god kind of attitude <laughs> and, and and what what interested me in religion and what I, got me into the whole anti-theism in a sense was the way 
I felt that conservative religion, and, I, and I, I'm not being hard on all religion. I have religious friends. I'm, 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 religion to me is not necessarily interesting, except when it manifests itself in bad ways. I'm not running around demanding to know which God people believe in or, or anything like that. But there's certain strains of religion, conservative, fundamentalist, that have a huge impact on, on liberalism and freedom of expression. I just happen to be a free speech liberal advocate. So th that's what I really honed in on. And then I, I kind of found that this new progressive quote unquote woke uh ideology mimicked religion in a lot of ways and i felt like a lot of tools that i developed over the years going for religion were quite useful in that sense so i mean in terms of defining woke i mean really uh at its inception it just it sort of meant somebody would socially progressive views which i don't have a problem with I, I would i mean it's become a dirty word but i would say i'm a progressive in the true sense i want an increase in freedom and rights i, I want to make sure minority groups aren't oppressed or, or discriminated against and are afforded all the rights that i demand for myself and um, where something needs to be changed to reflect that I, i'm for it so I, I would say i'm a progressive but what i found now is wokes obviously used as a pejorative and i i don't think that's entirely unearned I think a lot of people have wielded their progressive attitudes to smear and attack. I think their form of activism, if you can call it that, it, it, it is a form of destruction rather than progression. I think it can actually dial attitudes back in a sense because obviously there's always a reaction to these things and they, they do seem to be infecting. I mean, it's not... It's, I've always thought, how big of an issue is it? Is it because I'm swimming in social media waters that I think it's the entire sea? Hmm. Uh, and it turns out it is far more further reaching than that. We've seen it infest academia, uh, politics to an extent, media, TV, movies, music, award shows, everything you can think of now, there seems to be an aspect of woke finger wagging. Uh, hmm. And it does, it does feel to me like a very tribal way of operating it almost feels i know virtue signaling is overused but it does a, a lot a lot of the time feel like somebody's stating their you know progressive credentials rather than trying to affect any change or engage in in sincere discussion on the topic so i i think not only is is woke wrong in principle a lot of the claims it makes for itself on gender race uh, social cohesion i think it's very damaging to them causes so as a, as a progressive liberal i, I would oppose this new woke um, charge to the, you know, the progressive utopia that a lot of people, too many people seem to be pushing at the moment. So you would say, because this is what a lot of people come back to me with, because I complain about it. And I, I think as well, as something I mentioned on your show um, was, was this thing of a lot of people are not that bothered until it happens to them. And I think that applies to mm. Anything, That's a great point. you know, it's not just wokeness, it's anything. And no one's bothered until it happens to them. It's very easy to go out and say, hey, I'm a great person. I believe in these progressive causes until you're somebody who feels that, you know, they've been told they can't have a job because of their skin color, because they're white, because they're male or whatever. And then suddenly that's, you care about it and nobody else wants, wants to hear you talk about it. So, so where, where is this all leading in your, in your mind? You know, what, what's the worst case scenario from, from all of this? Oh, absolutely. It would be uh, some sort of white identity politics based nationalism that mm. will push back. I, I just think that's what we're going to see now. And it's something I've whinged about and warned about for years, uh, th you know, worrying about this coming over the hill because uh, and I don't think anyone writes about this better than Douglas Murray, for instance. I think in his, in mm. his uh, latest book, The Madness of Crowds, he talks, I think he uses a train analogy to the point where he says, you know, the train was already in this, almost in the station. We were almost there in terms of gender and racial equality, or at least getting society to a point where the the idea of color blindness was a valued principle. And it feels like there's been an effort or certainly the, the consequence of some of this progressive uh, pontification on race has caused a pushback. And that you're going to see people behave in bad ways to this. And you've made some good points the last time I had a discussion on this about, uh, you know, how, how further along the political scale some of this might make you from where you would have started mm. in, an, in an environment without some of this, uh, this uh, crazy uh, yeah. woke identity politics. So you're going to see a, a young generation of men now who statistically young white men in Britain, especially of my, sort of my working class background, uh, that social economic state. So at the bottom of the ladder in, in terms of education and opportunities, I think they're, they're probably the first generation where that's true. I mean, they're, they're historically, 
you know, white men uh, have had it easier than minorities. I openly accept that, but I do feel there's been somewhat of an overcorrection to make it go the other way. So you, you're going to get a lot of young white men who are missing out on opportunities because they're told they're privileged. Uh, maybe they're pushed aside in favor of diversity quotas and they're going to be told they're completely defi defined by their skin color. That's the mm. be all and end all of their identity, something they probably would have never considered otherwise. And they're either going to reject it or embrace it. And uh, there'll be a lot of people who, who will embrace it and say, yeah, you know what? I'm white. Uh, and I'm going to lean on that. That That's my thing. Uh, and so what? What of it? In fact, it's great to be white. Look at all these great things about being white. As a matter of fact, maybe white people are better. And, and that to me is terrifying because we know how dangerous white supremacy is. We know historically what it's led to. And I would just hate to see any resurgence of that in any form, shape whatsoever, uh, especially at a time when it felt like that had been, you know, put six feet under. Uh, certainly mm. I've seen huge amounts of progression on that just in my short 36 years on this planet. Yeah. I've been, I've been thinking the same thing that I think one of the worst things that can come from the whole work thing is, is an attack from sort of racist white people who, or, or people who are on the fence or people, as you say, or we were just talking about get pushed further that way. I was yeah. reading, uh, I read that, uh, JD Vance's hillbilly elegy. I don't know if you came across that. No. That's, that was this great book from a few years ago. And it was a guy who was a Republican. He's religious. So I had to sort of, sort of, you know, skip those religious bits, but he wrote about, uh, how he became a lawyer or something but he came out of kentucky in a really impoverished area where everybody you know they couldn't put food on the table basically and they were just being told all the time that they are just so privileged and basically the point was you know are you surprised that they voted for trump if, if people from these mm. elite universities in new york and the west coast were just telling them over and over how, how privileged they were they're just like well screw you i'm voting for trump i think people really underestimate how much of the rise of trump was a pushback to quote unquote PC culture. I think that played a massive part in people saying, yeah. you know, I, I I don't necessarily think Trump's brilliant. I don't think he's great, but he's a he's certain certainly somebody who will who will stand up to all this nonsense that I'm hearing. And it, it, it I mean, uh, uh, for me, that's an overreaction. I wouldn't I would not have voted for Trump. I don't think you could pay me to vote for Donald Trump, but I understand it. And what I saw in the wake of it was too many people just dismissing millions and millions of people as as racist and i thought have you learned nothing is this is this how you're going to respond to every single political decision that does not go your way have you any idea how much just throwing the word racist around has caused the rise yeah. of donald trump uh, and it doesn't appear there's been any correction on the left as far as i can see i'm hoping the election of joe biden might calm that down it'll certainly improve the media cycle I hope, but um, I don't think you can placate the progressive left, unfortunately. I think there will always be something uh, to muddy the water yeah. on. Well, it's something for them to do. It's something for, for, for people yeah. to reach for, to strive for. I'm a big football fan. I, I think you are as well. Is that right? You're into football. I mean, I'm a bit of a pretender nowadays. I used to be <laughs> massive on my football and I've kind of, yeah. I kind of dip in and out on the big fixtures. Well, it's so funny because I, I get it totally because I've been watching Tottenham since I was four years old or whatever. When I was two, I think my dad would, put Tottenham shirts on me and say, Arsenal, boo. And that's been instilled in me from a young age. And it's so funny. Yeah. I'll talk to Arsenal fans and I'll say, this Tottenham player is better than that Arsenal player. And I really believe it. And he believes, he really believes the other way. And I think football's a great way to see how that tribal thing inside us can really... I've been assaulted twice wearing a football shirt <sighs> as a kid, just on site. Like, and that, that I, I still... I. I to this day, I'm a little bit uncomfortable wearing football colours wow. outside the house. What team and, was uh, it? It was a Manchester United t-shirt. I think it was the yeah. day after they'd won the treble. I was walking across the local field and some guy just came over and floored me. And uh, I was only in my teens, you know, it wasn't, I think, you know, it, was, and I, it, it happened so quick. He was gone. And I think that was the last time I, I sort of ventured out the house in a football wow. kit. Uh, yeah, but it can be, I mean, you, you see it on local pubs uh, on match days, don't you? No colours, no jerseys, etc. It can yeah. be, it is a religion to some people, football, which is, which is a shame. It's a great example of just the way we just, I mean, because I watch it and I love it and I get so passionate about it, but it's such a ridiculous, stupid thing to care about. Mm. And yet it has total control over my emotions and the way I respond and react to people. It gets me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, if you were to ask anyone, that knows me to describe me. There's one phrase that I'll, I can guarantee you will always come up and it'll be laid back. 
you know, I, they, they just say, um, to me, I'm like, if you could just look in my head, you'd have a different opinion. <laughs> but apparently I, I have a calm demeanor. Um, mm. But if I'm playing football or I'm watching football, yeah. absolute lunatic from, <laughs> from naught to 10 wow. uh, in a second uh, over anything, you know? So it, yeah, it is one of them things that, that can just um, inspire instant tribal behavior yeah. i think if you don't have a football team you need something else and for some people it's you know maybe they're an artist maybe they're this or that i do tend to find would you agree with this not always because it's just quite an easy insult to, to make i suppose but people who are particularly left or right wing with the ideologies and stuff maybe don't have that much else to their personalities i i've that's i'm being a bit of it's a bit of a low blow i suppose i feel like it's like they don't really have much else so they have to define themselves as i am this is my personality i'm very left i'm very right i'm pro this pro anti that yeah because that them things have fast become synonyms for good or bad yeah people will use right wing just when they mean bad they don't necessarily mean the opinion falls on the uh <laughs> the right of the political scale they just mean it's bad oh, he, oh she's a right winger he's a right winger um and people were essentially when they, I noticed during the last UK election when they were voting their, you know, posting about their support for Corbyn, they were just saying, look at me, I'm not a racist. Hmm. That that was what they were doing. So I I, I think... I, ironically, it was the, the, it was the, what was it, apart from the BNP, the only party to ever been uh, labelled racist by a... Uh, but it's, it's Jews, it doesn't count. Yeah. We all know that. Oh. It's fine, it's fair, it's fair game. It's open season, apparently. <laughs> that's, that's one of the things that, I mean, it doesn't matter what side of the political scale you're on that's something i i have noticed on the left and the right All, I, like we were talking before reliably if you know someone's a climate change denier they're on the right uh you know if someone's in favor of open borders they're on the left you, mm. you can do this in your sleep you know pro-choice gay rights you can do yeah. it in your sleep as soon as somebody says anything remotely anti-semitic all bets are off it could yeah. it could be a Corbynite. It could be a it could be a member of the KKK. Yeah, yeah. You, you really don't know where you are, and it's just one of them things that just money. It's you know what anti-Semitism is the only thing that unites the left and right. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe maybe yeah. maybe, maybe Corbynites are onto something. It makes us feel quite important, I suppose. Jewish people. I think I said to you before. It's it's funny. I, I'm Jewish myself, and and uh, it's funny how when you get that sort of insult from the right, you get a racist thing said to you. You just. Hmm. I mean, I can't speak for all Jewish people, of course, but but maybe some are more or less sensitive than I am about it. I don't really care. I see it every day on YouTube. You see all sorts of nonsense on YouTube, on the comments and stuff. Uh, I don't care. When it's a left-wing thing, it's sort of come from an intellectual place, from somebody who believes themselves to be an anti-racist, and that's much more hurtful. That's what I find particularly worrying about anti-Semitism. I mean, I'm not Jewish. I've, I've no sort of ideological or, uh, you know, ethnic roots or uh, dog in that fight in that sense. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed about it, which I, which I find it particular, why I find it especially sinister, because we, we've all, we all know the garden variety racist we've seen, and it's, it's mainly born out of ignorance and you recognize it when you see it and it, it it gets instantly chastised and shut down in society. If something, someone says this person's stupid because of this skin color, this this person can't do this because of their skin color. We know, you know, civil society recognizes that and we know how ridiculous and ignorant it is and we call it out. But the thing about anti-Semitism is it's, it's very pseudo-intellectual, especially mm. some of the people who are really committed to it. It's wrapped up in a lot of conspiracy uh, and it, to, to, and this is why people are taken in by it. It's not abundantly clear up front that this is just, bear prejudice and that's yeah. all it is because these little seeds of truth sprinkled in through it and they were very smart yep. people that espouse it and that that could really take somebody in who's naive who's just coming into these ideas for the first time uh, and it, it may take them in in a way that garden variety anti-black racism wouldn't for instance uh, yeah. so yeah it's one of them things that i, I mean especially given I focus on Islamic fundamentalism, that, that's one of the main reasons anti-Semitism anti catches my eye. Because we always see it when, whenever they, especially in France, whenever there's a terrorist attack, if, they, if, if the Jews yeah. aren't the targets, they're, they're certainly the secondary targets, that, you know, uh, sh shoot down a cafe, then try and find a, a kosher supermarket. It always seems to be uh, the Jews that are in the crosshairs. And I, I find it fascinating as well that year on year, every year, uh, Jewish hate crimes top the table. And I think this is true in America as it is in the UK, but we don't seem to have wall-to-wall -wall public Jewish community leaders on the TV claiming victimhood for it. There's this weird inverse where mm. they appear top of the table in terms of hateful, anti-Semitic, yeah. uh, either physical crime or uh, you know verbal or online or however they categorize it now. And but we see a, a endless supply of uh, Islamic interest groups will, really uh, willing to rinse these figures and, and make them work in yeah. their figures uh, favor. So it's just very strange.
I think part of that is uh, as a again I can't speak for everybody but there's a there's a a bit of an aspiration among a lot of Jewish families particularly second third fourth generation families in the UK for example um they want to sort of fit in it was a big it mm. was a big thing of fitting in with the population which which I suppose in that way Jewish people are privileged in being able to do so physically um, I remember my my dad was very proud that he was able to send me to a private school because it was something he could never have dreamed of in his day and his parents could never have even dreamed of. And he did well for some time at work and was able to send me to private school. And seeing me with the sort of the British equivalent of the wasps, you know, with the big rugby lads, the, the blonde, <laughs> which was nothing like my family. I suppose other minorities don't have that opportunity as much. Although I should say that school I went to had people from all different backgrounds all fitting in together and having a, a, a well, not a good time because it was school. Um, I want to get on to, um, again, people listening are not going to be sort of specialists in woke and stuff. A lot of them aren't on social media and Twitter and stuff, so they probably yeah. won't have seen any of it. I, I know today I saw something about coffee being racist uh, and milk being racist. I know Andrew Doyle is very good at pointing this out. He's on Twitter. What are the kind of things that, that, that you and I are seeing on Twitter that maybe not every listener's seeing? I think anything that's trending in general, because the outrage machine that is Twitter, uh, it seems like one issue is everything to everybody one minute, and then it, it refreshes and you know the someone it was the turn of somebody else to have the two minutes hate i mean i try and check myself in terms of realizing that twitter isn't the entire planet certainly not even my hometown so no. yeah uh you could do with taking a lot of what people are outraged at with a pinch of salt the only issue i have with it is and i'm glad you mentioned andrew Dorr because he's exceptional on this issue to the point where he has this satirical take on it in the bag it's that's that's invaluable, uh, but he's also well read. He also knows the ideology and the mm. literature, and uh, he's a wonderful writer in his own. I always love spending time with Andrew or, or speaking to him. But um, I think I think last time I spoke to Andrew, we were talking about the fact that only a very tiny, tiny fraction of people are on social media. Uh, I can't remember what the number was, but it's it's a lot lower than you'd imagine. So that's not necessarily a problem. We can all be happy that these things aren't the be all and end of all of real culture or real life. It they exists uh, solely on, on this one platform. However, they do spill out into the real world is Biz mm -hmm. businesses, media outlets report on Twitter. Now it's a source of information for them. Um, people lose their jobs because of Twitter. It, it influences uh, the media, uh, academia. So it, it does seem to have a disproportionate effect. So yeah, the way I see it is this woke ideology where it tends to get spanked at the polls politically because the overwhelming majority of the population rejects it, rejects what they're selling. It has a disproportionate effect on the culture uh, and everything else. This tiny minority of people seem mm -hmm. to be hijacking our public discussion. There are so many sensible and interesting discussions we could have about very important and consequential topics, but we're just not able to because we have a disproportionate number of people willing to ruin it for everybody else, really, with their with yeah. their identity politics, which is what it is at the end of the day, woke ideology. It's, it's a return of identity politics. Uh, we, we've always had some form of identity politics, and it's not always necessarily a bad thing, depending on how it's channeled or who's channeling it, uh, but this feels like a particularly toxic form of it that's having an adverse effect on on freedom of speech which is is my chief uh preoccupation nowadays i think it's funny that you describe it as almost like a small cabal of elite people in the, the woke left who seem to be having um a, a really huge impact on actual public day-to-day -day life because that's the very uh beliefs i think a lot of them hold about the jews or at least if not the jews the sort of rich elite yeah and i, I do i mean it feels like a bit of a, a middle class luxury to me at times to be honest the, to be so committed yeah. to your your woke credentials um yeah i just feel like people going about their day-to-day -day life who don't care about gender yeah. don't care about sexual orientation they just basically want to know can i work for a living yeah. uh can i have can i see my kids can i can i afford to buy the shopping can i maybe take a holiday once a year can i you know just get on with life they don't want to have this these strange and it's it's, it's borderline neurotic a yeah. lot of it uh they don't want this foisted upon them so when you have candidates for labor telling you that biological sex isn't real or um, they see the way Jews are spoken about or you get told um, 
that you were living in a white supremacist nation, uh, they're going to have something to say about that at the polling booth. I've typically been a Labour supporter all my life until the, the last two elections. I voted Lib Dems before that, voted Tory for the first time in my life at the last election, which is a big deal coming from North Manchester. The hatred of the Tories runs very deep. I remember two election cycles ago, I was, I went for a, a pint with my dad and we were just talking about politics without shouting or screaming, you know, like normal people are able to do. <laughs> and I remember asking him how he intended to vote at the next election and he said he would vote in Labour. And I said, why? And he said, because of Thatcher. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, that's that's how deep that goes. Wow. Um, so yeah, there is that kind of attitude uh, in the North working class uh, environment uh, until this last election when I think um, a lot of people, or certainly the next generation of people kind of shirked them tribal yeah. expectations. But I, I, what I was trying to get at is I don't necessarily think the opposition has to be any good anymore. I certainly don't think the Tories are particularly good. They just have to be an opposition yeah. to some of this crazy PC nonsense and, and they, they, they'll they get the vote of the average person. So that, yeah. that's that's worrying. There is, does seem to be a middle-classness about uh, the woke thing. I mean, I, I can attest to that. So, so again, it was this thing I remember, I remember being a young teenager and saying to my dad, you know, are, are we posh? And he said, well, you are. <laughs> Uh, because you know, I'd grown up under different circumstances to what he had, you know. Um, but in any case, like the people I, yeah, a lot of people I went to school with, there, there seems to be this impression that it's like, oh, well, you would be more woke if you were working class, then you would understand all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, but the only people telling me that are middle-class rich people talking about, again, if you can't feed your family and all you're seeing from Corbyn or whoever it might be on the left is like, is trans and Israel, which are very important points but hmm. don't have anything to do with the day-to-day -day lives. It's, it was just destined to end in failure, I suppose, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do feel that in terms of division in the country, I think class is probably the the biggest one still. Um, yeah. I mean, I, did, I didn't realise I was working class until I got a bit older. I just assumed people with posh accents just existed in the movie world, <laughs> uh, really. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't... And I'm very sceptical of the whole there's a uh, virtue in being working class as default. No, I, I know a lot of working class people, fucking idiots, a lot of them. So yeah. it's, it's kind of like you have to, you have to judge people on individual terms. I'm not necessarily anti-aspiration or anti-wealth or anti-posh. Uh, I, I, you have to deal with people yeah. where they are. I feel, I, I, I'd hate to, I understand I'm working class. I understand I'm, uh, there are limits to my education and vocabulary because of this. I have a, a regional accent. I know that's going to um, have an effect in some way, but I, I, I really, really resent the idea of letting it define me and, and or not necessarily that wearing mm. it as a badge, as a point of pride. I don't necessarily think it's something to be proud of any more than growing up in privileges. I think, I think uh, we need to jettison a lot of ideas about what divides us in that sense um, and assuming there is instantly virtue in one and, and, and um, evil yeah. in the other. Well, you've got a, a very rich vocabulary and I, I think um, Russell Brand sort of proved that point wrong about class and vocabulary because he's got hmm. the most phenomenal vocabulary I've ever heard and uh, with quite a working class accent. Park life. <laughs> yeah, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> so tell me about, right, and I want to get on to Ricky Gervais. Right. Mm. Um, and I'm very wary of how to approach this because I don't want to make out like it's sort of a Notting Hill thing where, you know, Hugh Grant's working in a bookshop and then he meets this huge star kind of thing because you already had your own thing going <laughs> um, <laughs> where you had a lot of followers. You were already something of a thought leader. Ricky Gervais is probably an even bigger star than Julia Roberts' character was in that film. I mean, I can't think of a more famous uh, comedian in the world, maybe even a famous person. He's up there with sort of Brad Pitt, I think, in terms of household names. What happened and how did it, what, what happened with that? It's madness. It is madness. And I, I honestly do. I mean, I, I, just with the way you termed it, then I started getting a little bit anxious because I, I try not to think about it too much because <laughs> if you if you really think about it too much, it's, it's insane, isn't it? It's yes. insane. Um, so, I mean, it's funny, really. It kind of, it's completely full circle because a lot of the stuff I was doing on Twitter, uh, uh, you know, going for God and, and mocking and ridicule was very much inspired by... His stand-up, I don't I think it was Animals, which mm. would have come out when I was, I would have been 19, I think. I'll have to check that. He does this incredible bit where he dissects the Bible. He, yeah. he, you know, he has it there in front of him on stage and he, he mocks it and it's just so wonderfully done. 
And um, at, at the time, I remember seeing this and it was quite exhilarating because I wasn't particularly religious. I was I was critical of religion, organized religion, certainly. But I was still under the impression that, you know, you, you, you must respect religion. You must respect religious people. You mustn't speak with disrespect about scripture. Uh, and that kind of turned it on its head for me. I thought, well, obviously you can. And maybe if it's <laughs> this funny, you should. Um, so... I, I was I was doing my thing on Twitter, just um, correcting people's spelling and pointing out <laughs> logical fallacies and things like that. And I got retweeted onto Ricky's timeline, and he he just followed me and started engaging with my tweets. And for no reason whatsoever, it was just very complimentary and, and generous. And he uh, basically instructed a lot of his followers to follow me. I think you know, I don't know if you remember as far back as when Friday Follow was a thing on Twitter. No, where you'd recommend, yeah, you'd, you'd hashtag FF and put in the, the handles of people uh, uh, who you would recommend to your audience. And obviously, Ricky Gervais has got millions of followers. He's, he's a comedian at the top of his game. Uh, and um, I just used to sit there and watch my followers go up by the thousand every Friday that he'd do this and just be, me and my girlfriend would sit there staring at me phone going, is this, <laughs> is this real? Is this happening? Because it, he wasn't, and I, I probably don't, I don't think I've ever told him this, but I, I'm a massive fan of Ricky's work and and especially the office. I mean, you'll you'll know. I, I would imagine when a, a bunch of people get together, are fans of a certain show, they can probably spend an entire evening just communicating in office quotes. Yeah. I, I'm one of those uh, boresome individuals that does yeah, that. So me too. Yeah, he, he, I, he just. Uh, I think I just chanced it once uh, and asked him to come on my podcast, and he said yeah. And that was just a wonderful experience. Dead laid back. These. You know, there's no um, airs and graces about him. I don't. I don't think anyone's told him he's famous. <laughs> uh, if that makes sense, he's just very, very laid back and conversational. Puts you at ease, and uh, I, and I think that that just led to him doing. You know, he was doing his deadly serious show in London. And he was looking for people with different voices to come down and talk, and uh, I, I ended up meeting him in person uh, several times, recording episodes with him. And I, I have to say, it's the most fun I've ever had. Once you get over that initial moment of incredible terror. Yeah. Um, at all the stupid things you can say in the presence of someone with a massive reach, uh, it's just great fun. The easiest thing ever, the quickest hour that you could spend. So yeah, it's great fun, and uh, wow. I, I try not to think about it too much. Because you can't have thought, yeah, when when you first got the messages going, you can't have thought, well, he's, I'm going to ever meet this person in real life. And what no. was mad was because I, you know, he had that podcast out for a while, and and I don't know how many that. It, if that many listeners will be aware of it, because it was in a particularly weird place to find it. It wasn't just on like Apple Podcasts. It was, was it Siri? How did I get it? I got it through a weird app. Yeah, so I think it, it depended on your territory. I think in the States and the surrounding territories, you'd get it on their own subscription platform, which was Sirius. However, the UK uh, had it on YouTube. Um, oh, okay. So if you were in the UK, you could access it on YouTube. I was getting it through a books thing on, on the phone. Oh, on Audible, yeah. You could buy them through Audible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I was doing that. So it was, it's the only time I spent money on a podcast. But I, I'm the same as you. I could listen to him for. I just, I just love Ricky Gervais. And what was amazing though was he was having different guests every week. But it was you over and over again. It was almost like it was the two I'm of just your show. Always available. That's all that is. <laughs> um, well, I remember because um, it, it, it's not. It's very last minute. You're asked to come down, and you, you're not really told what you're going to talk about. You have a, you have a good ten minutes before, and just having a chat, and then someone else say, "Oh yeah, we should talk about that on the show," and that kind of lets you know. But I remember getting there um, early and just sat there, and I, my my girlfriend was messaging me saying, uh, "Do you have you any idea who you're on with today?" And I went, "No." I said, "It's probably it'll probably be Robin Ince." Just joking, because you know Robin Ince is this yeah. massive name in the in the comedy sphere, and he he releases a lot of science. Uh, um, based content in audio with, you know, Brian Cox is, is somebody of, who I've admired for a long time. And it was him. He just walked in. So I, then I'm, then I'm nervous again. <laughs> that, uh, that, I mean, the, the presence of two world famous comedians, you know, but yeah, it's, it's very, very laid back. Yeah. Especially because Robin Ince does have quite wokey views, which I've, because you get Ricky and him sort of argue with each other a little bit about that sometimes. Yeah. I saw there was a, there was a bit of that off air as well, actually. It's really <laughs> funny. They're like a married couple. You kind of, you kind of think, is this going to spill over? And then oh. obviously they're back to where they are, you know, but they've, they've known each other for so long. They've just got that, that relationship and rapport and understanding where they can scream at each other like a married couple and be drinking tea the next minute. Yeah. It's really funny. So what happens is Ricky, does he send you a message and go, mate, do you fancy coming down? Because you said we're told. Is that, or is it Ricky's agent or something is saying it? 
He he has a PA. So I yeah. think, I mean, initially it was Ricky who, who reached out to me personally and just said, okay, well, somebody will be in touch. What's your email? So from then on, it was the PA who uh, who, who asked me down. Oh. Rick, Rick, to be fair, it, it could have just been the PA that really liked me and Ricky might have been like, this, this fucking guy again. What's going <laughs> I, on? I don't think that was the case because he seemed very fond of you. Um, he was quite open about that. Very nice. Very lovely. Oh, that's such a brilliant story. He's exactly what you'd expect as well. You you, you often worry about meeting people you admire and look up to because you think, oh, if, they, if they say something, that's going to ruin this for me. You know, it's quite kind of kind of like yeah. a selfish thought, isn't it? You want them to be a certain thing. But yeah, he, he's exactly how you would imagine. He's always on. He's very, what I like about him as well, he's very, he understands people. And I think you see that in mm. his, his TV work, especially Afterlife. He, he gets, he's got a, I say he's got a level of emotional talent, intelligence that I think he's, I mean, he's very smart as well in, in the sort of like the academic sense. But I think as a comedian, having that emotional intelligence to understand people, what makes them tick, yeah. I, I think he's really useful. Uh, but yeah, he's uh, not got a bad thing to say about Ricky at all. Yeah. After the podcast, you know, you go your separate ways. Are you tempted to sort of say, mate, do you want to go for a, a drink? It's funny because I can't remember where I read this, mm. but it seemed like good advice at the time. And I think it was, you know, if you if you know someone who's, famous or has a lot of demand that the, the kindest gift you can give them is to leave them alone <laughs> <laughs> so i i can't imagine what someone like ricky gervais's inbox looks like there's all there'll always be people asking him for things they'll always be wanting him to be yeah. doing this for them or that for them so i tend to uh not reach out for the sake of getting a response yeah. you know what i mean there, there are times when I've, I've I've dropped messages or whatever you but i tend to and, and then i then i start neurotically thinking does he think that i uh, don't like him what's you know what i mean so you, you can't yeah. really win well he thinks you don't like him because 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 i'm not mess- messaging him you probably think why why is that guy not talking to me anymore well if he's uh, messaged but- you presumably you reply yeah sure oh absolutely yeah i, I don't <laughs> don't ignore him obviously but yeah. we, i'm not like I, I don't you know we're not on the phone together all the time or constantly yeah. in communication or anything I, t- I tend to just try and leave him alone until unless i've got a good reason not to I've sent a bunch of messages to Louis Theroux, who I think follows both of us. Is that right? Yeah, I tried that. Yeah, he follows me. I, I tried to get him on yeah. the podcast and uh, I, I think I chanced three and I thought any more feels like a bitter X. <laughs> I think really? I, t- I tried about 58 times. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, how many? Because how, I've even got it myself and I'm sure you do. So once the podcast hit a certain amount of listens, there's already, you know, people who are so nice and they send really long, lovely emails and long messages and these kinds of things. As, as nice as it is, it's like, okay, when am I going to find the time to do that? It's, ad- it's in the night. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, I feel bad about this. And I, just you saying that now hmm. has made me realize I've got nice emails yep. from April that I probably haven't responded to uh, because, you know, and, I'd, and I just I sometimes... I've realized now when communicating with people who probably get a lot more of this than me, uh, they'll often reply with one or two word answers and it can feel a little bit terse yes. at times, but I've, I've, I've come to think now it's probably they're just in, in, you know, they've got so much in their inbox. Yeah. That's an efficient way of making sure they respond, you know, just quick. So I, 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 I toyed with the idea of doing that a, f- a few times, but then thought I, I might come across as an asshole. So yeah. I, I'll just ignore him completely now. And <laughs> you know, they think worse of me, but I, I will oh, get around to it. I'm not joking. The yeah. amount of emails I've, I've picked up from months down the line and just said, I'm really sorry. I didn't get back to you at the time. Cause it's, it plays on my mind. Like yeah. someone's took the time to send something really nice. And I've seen it when I'm out somewhere and I thought, Oh, I'll do that when I get home. And then before yeah. you know it, you, you know, you, you're recording or you're doing something, you don't get around to it. So I should just, yeah acknowledge it and say thank you to anyone who contacts me and it was not got a response by maybe this time next year you might hear from me as you say though it just it sounds cold i was upset a little bit uh I, when i because i emailed louis through my documentary for the bbc because i thought it was made in his image to an extent you know and i thought oh, mm. this would be great and that came he, across actually it was very uh very louis through vibes quite, very quite Louis-ish. socratic in approach yeah <laughs> i sent him any any reply saying thanks for this we'll try to watch and that was it and I was a bit gutted at the time because I thought, but then everyone was saying to me, come on, you should be just delighted. He was so polite and he took the time to reply. And it's one of those things that we were talking about earlier. When it happens to you, not that either of us have ever got, he's got like millions of followers. But when you start to have your inbox filling up, even a, to a tiny fraction of what his is, you do start to go like, okay, now I get it. I get it. Now I he, get it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was actually lovely he replied at all. So, yeah. Did you keep up? Have you seen what, um, that Julie Birchall story this week? Yes. So... <laughs> Um, I'm not sure where I am with this. I've actually reached out to Julie and she did respond. We should explain what it what happened. 
yes. So uh, from what I can see, um, she had a book coming out, ironically, in the new year uh, about, uh, it was, I can't remember the title of it, but it was a, it was about the culture wars. It was about, mm. it was an anti-woke polemic, I think she was writing. Uh, and then she was seen to be going after a prominent personality in the UK, Ash Sarker, uh, of uh, left-wing, is it Novara Media mm. fame? Um just very gobby opinionated person that always seems available for our, for our news channels as well. Yeah. Uh, but it, the, from afar, and I haven't had a proper look at this in terms of context, but from a, just as a glance over, it did appear that Julie had chosen the, uh, you know, Muslim identity of Ash as a focus for attack mm. uh, out of nowhere. I don't, I don't know if there'd been anything that had led to this or not. Mm. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll have to look over it because I'm very careful about labeling people with the, you know, bigotry or um, anti-Muslim bigotry or anything like that. But it did appear that she was going for this person solely on the basis that she identified as a Muslim, which yeah. seems like um, a, a cross of the line to me. But then obviously you can talk about whether that, that uh, you know, warrants her losing her entire book deal. I may have completely mischaracterized that entire That's affair. my understanding of it as well, actually. Right. It, it's a really complicated one because the irony is that she was writing a book, obviously, about cancel culture, which a lot of people on in the, the woke uh, sector deny exists. And then her book was cancelled. <laughs> but she did. It looks like, again, I'm the same as you. I want to be very careful. But from, from first appearances, it looked like she did quite a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, and I'm very sensitive, obviously, as somebody who spends a lot of time criticizing Islam and it doesn't matter how carefully you choose your words, you're going to be accused of anti-Muslim bigotry. Uh, Islamophobia is the, the go-to term, isn't it? So uh, so I want to be able to protect people against that, but I also want to be able to criticize people who are genuinely, you know, genuinely being bigoted. Yeah. And it, it, you know, the, the conversation has been made a lot difficult by people who falsely throw the label around, uh, of course. So that's why... I thought it'd be a good idea to try and speak to Julie directly and see if she'd be interested in recording an episode on it. I mean, she's yeah. she's um, um, indicated she'd be open to it, but we've not got anything in the calendar yet, so that may or yeah. may not happen. I, I don't know. I had a similar thing with her. I think she, she was right. wor worried about legal stuff as well because people were threatening. I think Ash was talking about getting legal stuff involved. I don't know. I mean, is there there um, an aspect of defamation or libel? Libel about Mohammed. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Yeah, the implication when she said that Mohammed was sleeping with six-year-olds was that it? I think she said that. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think if you want to be very critical of um, historical figures like Mohammed, especially how it pertains to you know literature that's canon, like the Hadiths, for instance, in terms of how old his brides were, uh, or, or certainly how old his uh, they were when um, marriage was consummated. I think these they, these are all very fair topics for open discussion, especially when you look at some Islamic countries that take this as a, a benchmark for their law. Mm. Uh, so I, I think we can have this discussion. We can talk about a religion where the central figure uh, he did appear to have sex with children. You know what I mean? It's uh, if mm. I, I'm, I'm waiting for Muhammad to get cancelled. Uh, but as we know, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of very uncomfortable things uh, regarding this conversation, in, in terms of the the possibility of having your head cut off in the street, is one of them. I'm not not a big fan of that scenario. Yeah. I have to be honest. Imagine what uh, that would feel if, like. Because it's not quick, know. is it? It's it's certainly not. And as a matter of fact, <sighs> uh, not it's not always successful oh. either. Uh, I mean, if you look at someone like Lee Rigby, that was a an attempt oh. at decapitation, uh, and I don't think it, I don't think it was managed. I can only. <sighs> Hope he wasn't conscious at the time. I think he was hit by a car first, but it is is certainly one of the. I mean, that's it's, it's barbaric, isn't it? It's barbaric. It's 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 a horrible, horrible yeah. thing to consider and certainly experience. I would imagine so, uh, but it does seem to be a, a pastime of a particularly fundamentalist worldview, unfortunately. And nothing yeah. can get you in trouble quicker nowadays than uh, blaspheming against a certain religion's central figure, and it's just. I understand it. I understand why people are unwilling to talk about it um, because of that. I just, I'd, I'd like to push for an acceptance of that fact though. People, I would be quite happy with people saying, you know what, I, I don't want to talk about that. It's scary. 
I'm scared what might happen to me, scared what might happen to my family. At least then I think it'd push the conversation in a more productive yeah. direction. I always remember a moment on question time that, that sent shivers down my spine. It really did because uh, in question time for Americans, it's a, it's a program in the UK where politicians and sometimes celebrities go and talk about sort of the political idea or notion of the day and people in the audience ask uh, questions. And it was at the time when Boris was being um, attacked, maybe rightly for, for what was what was he comparing the burqa to? Post -box. Letterboxes. Letter letterboxes. To letterboxes. And... Which he, it's an offensive thing, particularly for a statesman to to, to say, you know, it's, it's stupid. Yeah. But then somebody stood up, um, got very angry and very emotional and started shouting, you do not criticize someone's religion. You do not criticize their religion. And it got like a, you know, huge applause from the whole audience, everybody, even the people who were on Boris's side were like, well, I suppose not. And that was scary to me because I just thought, what? That's the, that's the one thing you should criticize. Well, everything, everything's open, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing about that, I mean, as we know, Boris Johnson is incredibly skilled at putting his foot in his mouth. That's that, that's a given. Uh, but the whole brouhaha over his comments on the veil was actually contained within an article he'd written, which is a very progressive mm. article. He was defending the rights of women to wear uh, these garments uh, if they want to. Uh, I think it was in response to a potential Danish ban that was being floated at the time. Yeah. Uh, and he, he wrote a really progressive um, article on why, the, you know, individual liberty is the important thing here and the state shouldn't be telling women what they can and can't wear. But he just happened to throw in this really, you know, um, facetious line about women uh, wearing the burqa resembling letterboxes. Yeah. Now, that garment in any other context would be fair game for that sort of ridicule and mockery. Uh, but you put it in the context of Islam and all of a sudden it's off the yeah. table. And, and certainly it's not even a, a sort of um, nominally Muslim practice. It's a very conservative form uh, of, of um, religious um, adherence to wear that garment in public. Mm. It, it, we're talking about hardcore conservatives here. So why we'd want to sort of propagate this idea that the conservative form of this religion is the most authentic and the one we must protect the most yeah. is really crazy to me. There's a lot of Muslims who, who who think this is ridiculous and absurd and worthy of ridicule, ridicule too, but they're not the authentic Muslims in, in the eyes of many. I, I, I've spoke to a lot of, like I've got um, uh, Muslim friends in the, in the business who are commentators, but they've, they're of a li liberal persuasion. And they'll be rang from, you know, news studios to ask, can they come on and give the Muslim uh, voice or opinion? And they'll be happy to. And then they'll be asked, do you wear the veil or, you know, the headscarf or anything like that? And they'll say, well, no. And they'll go, oh, okay, we'll get back to you. And they'll, they'll turn wow. on this. They, they won't be invited. They'll turn on the segment later that night and they'll have the, the hijabi pontificating on the issue. So they want the optics of the authentic Muslim, which just so happens to be the conservative strain, which we would happily mock and ridicule in any other form. If it yeah. was Christian conservatives are fair game for a good kicking, yeah. uh, you know, figuratively, of course, uh, but we must protect the conservative aspects of Islam. And I, I find that a very, very strange scenario we appear to be in where the 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 a leader in a quote unquote Christian culture uh, country can't say <laughs> the, uh, the burqas or the niqab rather looks a bit funny. Uh, because it does. I don't know if anyone's seen it. It looks really funny if you're yeah. not indoctrinated into thinking that's normal. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm a liberal. I'm not for bans. I don't like banning anything really. But, you know, there's a, there's a line between banning and protecting Islamic conservative norms, surely. Hmm. It's, a, it's a funny one because, again, as a Jewish person, I, th I feel like if somebody were to describe the Hasidic Jewish costume in that way i don't see them as any part of me anyway because they're so extreme they're nothing to do with me and they do probably look just as ridiculous as as the amish and as it, to, to our modern you know atheist eyes and it, the irony was actually on the left with like the corbyn stuff he did sort of get quite close to the hasidic jews 
They were like quite matey. But they were anti-Israel anyway, a lot of them, weren't they? Those ones, those, a lot, yeah, the ones he got really close to were anti-Israel ones. But then there were others that he just sort of got close to because they're just all so philosophical about stuff and they don't really care about what's going on. So it was sort of a photo opportunity, I suppose. Yeah, that just, yeah. It concerned me even more as, as I guess a, a devout atheist that I am. It concerned me even more. It's like, okay, so you, you can handle Jews as long as they act up as this sort of minority weird religion thing that you can handle. But you don't like the version of Jewish people who are just like, you and me and him yeah so. it's fascinating I, I interviewed um a gentleman called izzy pose and i'm not sure if you're familiar Things with him he's oh yes i think so yes is he a hasidic jew yeah so he came from a very conservative hasidic jewish yeah. sect and I, I mean like hardcore no tv no phones uh no reading kind of thing you'd have to sneak away to in a library to kind of learn about other things and obviously that's you know a huge fracture uh, in, in you know, in terms of his family and things like that, but he's he's. It's just interesting to me that you can have people born in this country, uh, you know, as British as anyone, but have a, a strange accent you can't yeah. quite place because they've come from a very insular Hasidic community, and I, yeah. I find that it's very strange. This idea of multiculturalism now. I mean, it literally is multicultures, pockets of different cultures and values and norms yeah. scattered around. You know doors down from each other uh but yeah it's, it's weird how that can happen in, in a seemingly open society how someone could be so insulated from everything oh, uh man. just on the whim of their parents religion basically well, well again i mean I, I lived and grew up my whole life in north london right down the road from where there was a huge population well huge it's not huge but it's the, the by their standards it's a huge population of, of jewish orthodox uh people in stamford hill golders green that area and yet i think my entire life i never met and spoke or spoke to a single one even as a jewish person myself my, my father and i none of us we never ever came across or spoke to them they were just people we saw walking across the street that's how insular they are i got to be a little bit careful because i, I yeah i did i did an episode with an ex Hasidic jew and then everybody started emailing and shouting at me and saying they're not a cult and i thought wow <laughs> seems like a cult to me <laughs> It's very culty. I mean, what's the difference between a religion and a cult, really? It's just a bit of time, isn't it? Or, you know, membership number. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. I think so, somebody somebody described it once. I think they said something along the lines of if the, the figurehead of your religion is still alive, then it's a cult. If if the if the figurehead of your cult's dead, it's a religion. I think that's that tends to work as a rule of thumb. That's I haven't thought of that. I like that. <laughs> I like that. So this podcast is more of a, a cult than a religion. Uh, at the moment, unless uh, unless you <laughs> snuff it in the evening. If you type Andrew Gold into into Google, you might find the article that says Andrew Gold dies, which was the singer who died about 10 years ago. Oh, you're very bitter about these Google searches, aren't you? <laughs> no. I went on about it last time, didn't I? Was... I've told you, I keep getting fan mail for the Peaky Blinder creator, Stephen <laughs> Knight, and not all of it's pleasant. Oh, man. Speaking of not pleasant, so... There was a there was a time when people on Twitter were calling you racist, and I, mm. I, I asked you about this already, but you replied saying um, that they were paedophiles. So what happened yeah. there? I think being racist, genuinely being racist, gen, you know, genuinely having overt prejudice for people with different skin color is a really terrible thing to be. And I think it's a bit silly that I have to say that out loud, but that's where we are. I think being a racist is one of the worst things you can be. I think it's certainly one of the worst things you can, one of the worst labels you can weaponize given, given all that, that prejudice has cost humanity uh, throughout the years. And, and currently, you know, racism still alive and thriving in certain places. Uh, I just think to glibly throw that around to try and win a cheap point is is just a terrible thing to do. And it's certainly, it, it used to be very infuriating when people would do it to me, knowing that I'm not a racist uh, and, and I, I'm an anti-racist, uh, in fact. And having that label stuck to me without any attempts to back it up with any sort of form of argument or evidence was just deeply irresponsible. I thought it just cheapened a very serious issue. And I just thought, well, what's what's a comparable accusation? What can you accuse people of that is just as scorned in civil society? Mm. That is just as serious. We're not, maybe not as serious or more serious, depending on how you look at it. And that's to accuse people of being sexually attracted to children. Yeah. And it's funny when you do it. I think that's that's how I get around the ethical issues of throwing worse. that term around. Yes, paedophile's worse, of course. But then again, you can say, 
how are we defining paedophiles? Are we, de you know, you don't necessarily have to abuse children to be a paedophile. You can just be attracted to children. Okay. Uh, and no one wants to be thought of as being attracted to children anyway. Uh, so I, I just started, it was just funny to watch it unfold. Somebody had accused me of being racist in response to something that had nothing to do with skin color. And I just asked them the question, you know, when did you figure out you was attracted to children or just outright call them a paedophile? And they would be so indignant, you know, how dare you? make that accusation based on nothing whatsoever. And it was, it's kind of like performance art. It's kind of like, well, do you get my point now? Do you understand yeah. the game you're playing? If these are the rules that you're going to set out, uh, then you, you know, live, live by the sword, die by the sword is how I feel. And I, I fully appreciate it's very childish. It's very silly. Well, it's not, you've got a right to it, be not, childish sometimes, yeah. don't you? It was fun, I suppose, until, until did they start threatening legal action? Not against me. I think oh. I saw Lawrence Fox do it to quite That's a prominent right. figure. And yeah. they threatened legal action. I, I, I mean, the libel laws in this country, would it be libel or slander? It'd be libel because it's in print, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's difficult because I think one of the things you have to um, demonstrate in court is that your reputation has been damaged by whatever you've been labelled with. Now, the people I'm labelling a paedophile usually have anime avatars and six numbers after their name uh, and a handful of followers. So they're not necessarily people with a reputation to defend. Uh, they, they were quite often anonymous anyway. So I think I'm not a, I'm not a legal expert, but I might be on safe ground there. We'll mm. see. We'll see. <laughs> Are you going to continue doing it? I'll uh, maybe, I mean, there's, there's one thing that I worry about recent, uh, that I have worried about for a long time is, um, getting a Twitter ban. And it, it has, I, I'm someone who is, you know, I've never used a single expletive on Twitter uh, unless I'm quoting it. I, I've never used, uh, yeah. a, 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 an insult. Uh, at somebody that's like a swear word or, a, you know. You're, you're uh, sounding more conservative now. Yeah. 1950s dad. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can't, no cuss words in the house. Yeah. But and, but this isn't some commitment to purity. I, I do swear. I, I think it's, I think swear words can be a beautiful thing. But it was, yeah. first of all, it was um, to stop any charges of the, uh, there was this, this idea that the atheists are angry at the world uh, when I first started doing this. So I, I didn't want to be abusive or swear at people just to show that, you know, I was calm. Yeah. Uh, but then it, there is, you know, you, there are people now that will report you for using certain words or what have you. And the people do get banned for this. Uh, and I, I realized at some point that if I get banned on Twitter, that's my ability to drive eyes and ears to my content, content just gets decimated overnight. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's a really sad thing to think about, uh, yeah. in terms of what I can say or who I can say it to on Twitter is that I, a part of me is thinking, is this the tweet that's going to get me canned? Cause I've been suspended so many times on Twitter and it's never been told to me what I've done, but it always, I'm always told under the sort of general banner of, uh, you know, uh, abuse or targeted harassment, which is something I've never engaged in. And obviously I've never engaged in it because when I appeal it, they say, Oh, sorry, our mistake hmm. and overturn the ban. So but I, what I think is that Twitter is just reacting to a, a an influx of people reporting an account, mm. and, and it's it's an algorithm that's taking action. I don't think there's anyone at Twitter HQ who knows who I am and has yeah. it in for me specifically, and is, is pressing a button. I just think it's an automated thing. That's uh, mob, but they, mob rule, then, isn't it? Mob it really rule, yeah. Is. So it, I'm on my last I, life, is what I'm saying. I think you'd probably. I, I might be wrong, but I think you'd be surprised at how how little Twitter would probably affect your like podcast listeners and that kind of thing. Because I, I don't think anyone, uh, maybe two or three people, I'd spend ages putting the trailer on Twitter. I think the vast majority sort of are they they listen to an episode, however they might come across it, and then it just keeps going and going and going. Looking at metrics is not something I do often, uh, but when I have dipped my toe in on uh, certainly on my blog when I write things, the vast majority of my traffic comes from a Twitter link. Oh. Uh, so th th yeah. there's that, but yeah, I mean, better not fuck up then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe throwing the word pedophile around at, at, at people is not the the wisest way to go. I like that. You've just I always wait for the perfect line to end the podcast on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was great. I'm, <laughs> it's a <the> perfect one. <laughs> Despite what Stephen and I were saying, do send messages because it does give me a warm and fuzzy feeling knowing that people are listening and enjoying this enough to send them in. 
So Andrew Gold underscore OK on Instagram or Twitter. Follow me and say hello. I always reply. Tell me which episodes you liked and so on and we'll have a chat. When I reach the levels of fame of Louis Theroux and Ricky Gervais, then maybe it will take up too much of my time. But right now, I really do love it. I also loved having Stephen on the show and was taken by how reasonable and, as he said, laid back he appears. I think it's important to show that not everyone who is against critical race theory and social justice warriors is a right-wing nut job. Stephen is a centrist from a centre-left background who has been brave enough to speak out against both the totalitarianism of the left and, well, the totalitarianism of the right. Do check out the Godless Bell Checker podcast or the Night Tube on YouTube. Thank you so much to the very generous contribution to Patreon from Mihaela Lapusneanu. I hope I got that pronunciation right. My Romanian is a little rusty. As I said at the beginning, any contributions, even just one pound or one dollar a month, goes a long way towards supporting the podcast as I do work a full-time job around this at the moment. And it takes up quite a lot of time. Don't worry if not, we're all struggling a bit right now. The main thing for me is that we're building a bit of a community and that my podcasts are keeping some of you company. For example, I got a lovely tweet from Rihanna Wezia. That's a terrible pronunciation, but she's from Holland. I don't know how to say that. But Rihanna Wezia who said, I binge listened every episode and I really have to blame you on missed hours of sleep, smiling face with open mouth and cold sweat. I've, I've copied the tweet into Word and it's written out. She, she's obviously put the emoji that where it's smiling and has a bit of sweat on its head and uh, Word has, has written out a smiling face with open mouth and cold sweat. That's quite funny. Uh, I really enjoy your style of interviewing. This is still her tweet, by the way. Your guests are very interesting, to say the least, and every interview sparks curiosity on the subjects. Thank you very much, Rihanna. That's so nice of you to say. And we'll keep chatting on Twitter. Then there's Laura R. from Argentina, who said, Ahora estoy escuchando on the Edge with Andrew Gold. Me super enganché, super interesante los topics y cómo lleva los interviews. Escuchalo. Basically, she's listening to it and she really likes it. Her friend Kaleidoscope I said, how refreshing your podcast is. I loved it. I hope you continue listening. This is me talking, by the way, now, not the tweet. I hope you could <laughs> I hope you continue listening. Or as you'd say, espero que sigan escuchando. Anyway, happy new year, feliz año to all of you, and I'll see you all next week when I've got scientist Andrew Steele talking about his new book, Ageless, which I'm currently reading and I'm absolutely loving. It's just about to come out. And it's about how we might go about curing aging. So hopefully some good news in the new year. See you then.